Okay, so I'll, I'll go right from the foundation of the company because it all sort of ties in together. So the company was founded in 1808 by John Heathcote. John Heathcote invented the first lace making machine right at the start of the Industrial Revolution. He had some trouble with his um, competitors and also uh, with Luddites who uh, smashed up his machinery. Um, he was originally based in the, in the Midlands of England and um, he decided to move. So he moved to the southwest of England, uh, 200 miles south and uh, Staff and Tiverton in 1816. Took over an old uh, woolen mill, which was redundant after the end of the Napoleonic Wars because it made fabric for the army and uh, it was no longer required. So that all went well. His workers came down the 200 miles and he was right at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution. He invented different machinery, steam engines, steam tractors and things like that. But really, it was his success in textiles that, that paved the way for the company today. He had the, he had the first um, factory um, school to educate the workers. He was ahead of his time. He um, set up businesses throughout Europe. He set up silk mills because he was making lace from silk. Uh, and he became a Liberal MP. So he was, he was an all-round sort of great innovator. So the 1920s, we started to weave fabric from silk as well. And uh, the parachute industry had just started. People started jumping out of planes, um, mainly for military uh, at that time. And then in the 1930s, we started to make parachutes as well. So in 1938, we took on a company that had relocated from the Czech Republic uh, for obvious reasons. It's re re relocated to the UK. Um, and we started making parachutes as well. And we made parachutes in the 1960s and there were problems with um, supply in the US because of uh, the Buy American Act and the Burry Amendment to that, which means you can only um, sell fabric to the US military if you're based in the US and 100% of the materials have to be made and sourced in the US. So we carried on making parachute fabric and our special niche was the ejector seat market. So the ejector seat market requires stronger parachute canopy fabric than standard troop carrying. It requires more heat resistance because you're in a hot, hot box on a underneath you know, in a jet. Also, you've got um, if you're on the tarmac in somewhere like Saudi Arabia, it gets very hot. Um, so that's where we, where we developed our speciality. Then in the uh, early 80s and 90s, we got involved with space projects because that was through Martin Baker at the time at an aerospace division uh, working on space. And we made the fabrics, the bespoke fabrics for the Huygens mission to Titan and the Beagle 2 mission to Mars. So those were our first two space fabrics. That was successful, but they were relatively simple missions because the, um, the objects to be landed weren't very heavy. Row forward to 2005 and we could see that uh, the space industry was starting to grow, um, especially in the States and especially there was talk about uh, commercial space exploration. And we started to decide to design a higher performance canopy fabric um, that would suit the needs of space. Started that in 2005, we went to the States and met all of the players involved in that market. So all the parachute manufacturers and also um, anyone else we could meet involved in that. And by 2000, this is a long time, it takes, this shows how long time it takes to develop something really special. We had our, our first fabrics ready to show in 2015. So it was a 10 year process um, to create the high performance canopy fabrics. Um, so the next stage was to show those to everybody. So we went to the, we joined the Parachute Industry Association in about 2007, which is the global uh, organization for parachutists and, and for the military parachutists in space, a lot, everyone's involved in that. But it's mainly a US organization. We joined that and we went to a, co we went to a few uh, exhibitions and there was also an exhibition run jointly with the Aerodynamic Decelerated Systems um, Conference people in uh, Daytona Beach 2015. At that conference we had um, a lot of interesting people come on the stand, people that worked on the Apollo missions and are still working today, uh, people that, that worked on various missions and they're all interested in this fabric, we, we, it's a new, new canopy fabric we showed them and they all said to us wow that's amazing, if only it had been available when we started 
XYZ project, it would have been great. Uh, so I was a bit disappointed because everyone had started their projects, like the Orion project with NASA was already on, on the go, etc. So we didn't know whether we, we would fit in anywhere. Um, there's a, another good story is we had some guys come on the stand who looked like we just thought they were skydivers, probably. Um, we had a good chat about everything. And at the end of it, I said, uh, well, let's do an exchange of cars. And it turned out they were NASA guys. And they were, ended up being the NASA guys that worked on the Mars 2020 project. So we made some good contacts. 2016, um, we get contacted by NASA or the Jet Propulsion Lab of NASA because the Jet Propulsion Lab based at Caltech in Pasadena handles the parachutes for NASA. And they said they had a, a major problem with the Mars 2020 parachute because the fabric they intended to use um, had ripped and wasn't suitable and had lost a lot of strength. And they'd asked around who could supply a suitable parachute fabric and who could design a new fabric for them. And all roads led to us. They spoke to all the different parachute um, manufacturers and everybody in the space industry said he'd coach to the people to go to. So at that point, um, they gave us a brief of what they were looking for, which was a, a very, very high strength canopy fabric. Um, with a very defined window of porosity that must not lose any strength after heat treatment. And we designed, basically we designed the, the canopy fabric based on that uh, brief. They came to visit us in Tiverton in Devon to approve us as a supplier to NASA. That was achieved. And we went to visit them a few times to go through the process of developing the, the products. Um, which were great visits because we got to see the uh, prototypes of the rover being tested. We got to see the capsule um, being built that was, was going to ship it in to Mars. And we got to visit the control room, mission control at Caltech in Pasadena as well. So a very, very good meeting and uh, good meetings. And we found out a lot about um, what their requirements were and why. So the reason for the heat treatment is because they need to kill the microorganisms before they go into space. And the problem with the heat treatment was that for normal nylon fabrics, that heat treatment, which is its extended period of time at high temperature, uh, causes this, the parachute fabric to lose about 50% of its strength. But with our fabric, it loses nothing because of the way we'd um, designed the fabric. So, um, that's basically the story of where we got to uh, and how we came to develop it and why. So I don't know what more you want me to say. Do you want me to carry on to the actual day of the landing or do shall I take some technical questions now? Um, I think we've, we've got some time. It would be great yeah, to hear about yeah the landing. Um, okay. I, 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 would, I would like to hear about that first before we get yeah, to the okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I've, I've gone through it fairly quickly. I agree. Uh, so, yeah, we, we um, developed the fabric. So 2016, they contacted us. We developed the fabric. They tested the prototype fabric. We went through a couple of iterations and then they said, um, yeah, let's go for it. We did a production run, which took us well into 2017. Um, and we had machines running 24 seven for months to make this, this production run. Um, we did a lot of work to make sure it was absolutely perfect. So it's not treated like a normal parachute fabric and parachute fabric already has a special attention compared to normal fabrics because it's safety critical. So there's a lot more maintenance of the machinery done for every parachute run and every part of the process steps, the dyeing, the finishing, everything. And uh, for the NASA fabrics, even more, even more uh, precise work that we do and uh, more detailed testing. Anyway, the completion of the run was about 2017 and it was all delivered. And that's, pre that's pretty much our part of that project completed. Um, but we were kept in touch all the way. So we knew about the different tests they'd done. So the, so the parachute's mortar deployed. You might have seen that. So it's fired out with a gun. It's not got a pilot chute, which is a chute that's deployed. If you ever do skydiving, you know, there's a chute that pulls out, a small chute that pulls out the, big sh the main chute. That's not the way they do it. It wouldn't work on Mars. So it's done with the mortar deployment. So they did mortar deployments um, 
indoors in laboratory facilities, then they did mortar deployments externally as well um, in the desert from the ground. And then they went on and did mortar deployments uh, from the Aspire rockets. So they fired the rockets up to high Earth's atmosphere to replicate Mars and fired the rockets there and checked the deployment. All went fine. Also, they did a couple of test runs in the, the biggest wind tunnel in the world, which is at the NASA Ames Research Facility in Palo Alto. We got to go there as well, but not on the day that it was being uh, deployed um, in there. So it's a bit unfortunate we couldn't see that happen. But, you know, there was an extensive amount of testing going on. So we knew we'd tested everything. We'd made everything as precise as it should be. We also knew that we had exceeded the brief. So our fabric um, was about 10% stronger than it needed to be. Uh, we know that NASA put plenty into the specification. So was, if anything, it was over-engineered from their part as well. So in the run-up, all this testing had been done, the run-up to the final day, the, the day of the landing, I think everybody was supremely confident that there would be no problem. Um, and I was feeling that during the day and I had a lot of conversation with people that make the parachute fabric during the day because we're working on the next project now, for, well, two more new projects for NASA that we're working on today. So everyone was pretty calm um, up until the last few minutes. And then <laughs> when it came to the last 10 minutes, I suddenly sort of got a little bit nervous because I'm watching it happen and, and the NASA guys are all talking about, well, if it goes wrong, we'll learn a lot. You know, and if it goes wrong this time, at least we've got lots of cameras. We can see exactly what's going to what went wrong. We can put it right next time. And I'm thinking, why are they talking in such a negative manner? You know, it's making me uh, making me feel nervous for the last few minutes. And I did get really, really nervous and um, concerned. And we had some, of course, because of COVID, we couldn't all get together and watch it. We're all spaced out in all different places around Tiverton. So we're all talking to each other and talking to the US and feeling nervous, but. It was a massive relief and a massive exhilaration when we uh, saw it finally land. The deployment was the first, once the deployment was done, I think we were pretty confident our part would work. But of course, we were reliant on the sky uh, crane to land it after that. And um, yeah, it's a massive relief when it did happen and um, massive sense of a, a, a job well done by everybody. Uh, I'd like say as well, it was probably in the team that from Heathcote Fabrics that developed the fabric and did the majority of the work. There was probably about six of us involved, um, key, let's say the key team members. But during the processing run and the development run, the production, the lab testing, uh, running 24-7 in all the departments, probably about 100 people would have touched or handled the, you know, the fabric in some way or the machines that were making the fabric. So it's a, it's a really big team effort to make a, a bespoke special project like this one. So I hope that gives you an idea of what we what we went through on the day. Absolutely. The yeah. No, oh, thank you, Peter. That was great. Um, I, let's open it up to questions because I, I don't want to. Uh, we don't want to run out of time or anything. Um, there were a couple of questions that had come through previously, but but let's open it up to to everybody and um, see. Uh, Peter, I see you. You've raised your hand. Yeah, I've very cleverly yeah. worked out how to raise my hand. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, um, I read about this um, interesting pattern on the parachute. Did you yeah. know what that pattern signified or what, did they keep you in the dark as much as everybody else? Um, yeah, they said I, I, as soon as it was, it was deployed and I saw it, I, I contacted the parachute manufacturer, it was Airborne Systems, North America, based in California. And I said to my contact there, Charles Larry, it's an interesting character, I said, Do you, you know, what's that all about then? What, mm. What's this pattern about? And he said, I can't tell you, I have to work out for yourself. I thought, cheers, mate. So I, could, I couldn't work it out. But I know I know the guy that did it. It's, it's one of the three guys that we thought were skydivers that came on the stand in 2015. Turned out to be Ian Clark. He was pretty senior in the project. And it was his idea to do it. Right. So, so it was, he's a pretty, it was smart kept pretty guy. hush hush then. Right. Sorry? It was kept pretty hush hush then. I was kept very hush hush. Yeah, I don't think the guys at Airborne Systems even knew what it meant. To be honest, I think yeah. it was just only a small number of people. They were given the pattern to put on. We were pretty nervous about it because you know if if they made a mistake and it was it didn't say what it was meant to say, it'd be pretty embarrassing for everyone. <laughs> that would have been, yeah, <laughs> if they just, if the segments around. Yeah. Okay, but that's personally, my question. I, I personally, I'm surprised. I haven't spoken to Ian yet, but I'm going to speak to him because. I think, you know, considering this, we're also risk averse in the 
in the parachute industry in general and in the space industry. We do things the same, we've always done them. Every canopy is normally balanced between uh, what looks red, but it's actually international orange, and um, white, which is undyed white, natural white colour, because dyeing it causes problems. There's all, I would imagine, well, I know, there's slight differences um, between sometimes between the dyed and the white. Slight differences in air permeability, for example. And so normally you would balance them up all the way around, but they must have been supremely confident that the differences were so minimal that it was worth the risk. Um, but technically, I thought that was interesting that they took that added risk. Yeah, it's not something you would do unless you were, yeah, pretty sure. Yeah, that's pretty probably. sure. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, it was it was very interesting reading about that afterwards as well. Added added to the story. <laughs> it did add to the story, and the damn mighty things was quite clever because you think about it sort of like. I took it afterwards that you sort of making, if it went wrong, you might use that as, an, you know, well, we dared mighty things that didn't quite come off. Yeah. It works both yeah, ways. It doesn't mean to succeed, does it? So, yeah. Yeah. It was a good quote. Thank Apparently you. Apparently they have it on the wall in JPL as well. It's one of their major, and I've been there, I didn't notice it to be fair, but apparently it is there in big writing all over the place on, in JPL. It's one, of their, it's one of their mottos they use a lot. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, Peter, one of the questions that we had that came in previously was actually about this um, image on your website, these looms. Yeah. Um, and um, the the comment was that this seems like a, a really uh, high tech uh, sort of state of the art um, manufacturing process, th the thread weaving operation. Um, can you tell us anything about these uh, machines and yeah, the, 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 machine, the machines you can see there are um, Picanol machines. Company they're made in Belgium, but we work really closely with this company to design uh, the machines and make them imp improve them so that we could do very wide parachute fabrics. Okay, so parachute fabrics normally fairly narrow. I don't know. Let's say one meter wide. But because of the space parachute's the biggest parachute, one of the biggest parachutes ever made, if not the biggest parachute, this Mars 2020 parachute, um, having the fabric as wide as possible means the minimum number of um, sewing points. And sewing points are a weakness, so they wanted wide fabric. So um, we've developed these looms with wide fabric in mind. We've actually got some more new equipment coming this summer, which will allow us to go even wider. So yeah, one thing is it's wide, it's fast, um as well which is required for the for the compact uh, weave that's required on these fabrics um and you can see on the right hand side you can see the weaving machine itself or part of it the front end of it you can't see the back end where the yarn's going in unfortunately and then so you see a walkway which we still use wood because it, it it works well um and uh, it gets worn a little bit these aren't very old machines but it gets worn as you can see then to the left is there's an inspection batcher unit so every meter of fabric can be inspected as we're manufacturing it, as well as at the at subsequent process steps. So those those um, they've got lights, as you can see. So we're inspecting the fabric as we're making it, as it comes up under the walkway, and then it's batched up. So yeah, they are they are pretty special machines. They're all relatively new. We bought them. They're all bought within the last ten years. I couldn't say exactly what age the machine is that we we made it on. Probably newer than that. What well, was newer at the time. So yeah. High tech stuff. That's great. Thanks. Um, another question that we had come through was about the fabric design process as it relates to the packing process. Yeah. So um, when it comes to what Heathcote does, are you um, folding? Or is the folding process part of what you do, or is that something where you just give the fabric to JPL and they do their thing? Yeah. Well. The folding process isn't something we do, but we can aid the, the folding process. So we would design the fabric so that it packs down small. Uh, so if I can explain with that, this is something that's come about with military fabrics. Sometimes they, they wanted to get the, the canopies bigger and bigger because soldiers are heavier, paratroopers are heavier and heavier. They're actually heavier because they were, and people today are bigger than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago, and then carrying more equipment. So you need a, the, the more the heavier the weight 
of the soldier fully loaded, um, the bigger the canopy needs to be or the less air it needs to let through. So there's two approaches to do that. You need um, one, yeah, you need to make the, the fabric um, lighter and less permeable to air. And then you have to, and you also need to make it uh, pack down smaller because we don't, they don't really want to be carrying a heavier pack and they don't really want to be carrying a bulkier pack onto aircraft. So we've designed fabrics to achieve that aim um, and that there's some tricks of the trade to do it. Um, basically, uh, it's not too, too much to say, the finer the yarn, basically, the thinner each individual yarn or thread, and within that, each fibre, the more you can pack in because there's less air space. You think of a, a bigger diameter um, filament, there'll be more um, air space. So you can pack it down tighter if you use finer filaments. Finer filaments tend to be more expensive uh, than thicker filaments. So that's what we do. That's how we've designed fabrics, mainly for paratroopers and ejector seats to get them to pack lower, uh, smaller. But for space, it's not really as relevant because for space, they um, use rams to, when the fabric's folded, to, to squeeze it in the smallest possible space. And they use vacuum and then they heat treat it so it's baked. And, it's, and by the time they've done that, it's like a lump of mahogany. It's compressed to the utmost level. So you don't do that with a, with a paratrooper pack, but you do with a space pack. So it's not as important quite for space to have an easy fold, easy pack uh, fabric as it is for other end uses, interestingly. That's great. Thank you, Peter. Um, I have a couple more questions, but does anybody else on the call want to ask a question? Yeah, I was going to ask a, a, a question. I, was in, I found it really interesting. Well, firstly, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to, to do this. It's really interesting. Um, I was having a look at your website and looking at the sort of range of range of things that you know the company gets involved with. And yeah. I, was, I was interested in 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 uh, how you think this new foray into interplanetary uh, interplanetary fabrics is going to affect the wedding dress market. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, don't so whether, wedding... I don't know whether you've had any inquiries about you know uh, NASA NASA grade veils. <laughs> no, but I can tell you, I can tell you that. So the the wedding veil is the last bit of our business, which is fashion or apparel related. And it's a legacy product because John Heathcote invented the first lace making machine. So we still make it, but it's a, a very small part of our business, but we still have a technical uh, unique selling point for that fabric. We have the only flame retardant uh, dress net and bridal net in the world. So all the others uh, burn easily, ours doesn't. So when um, there was a celebrity whose daughter was burnt wearing a costume, um, Oh yeah, from uh, yeah. Uh, Strictly Come Dancing. What's her name? Yeah, yeah. Claudia Winkleman. Yeah, Claudia Winkleman's daughter was burnt because she bought. I think it was from Hamleys or somewhere. It was a children's costume. It was made with net that burnt, right? And you, it's hard to believe this, but children's costumes are exempt from the rules for clothing because they're classed as toys. You're kidding me. I'm not. And we've tried to get that changed. It hasn't been. It still hasn't been changed. So they these these kids clothes that they wear for um, parties or you know Halloween and all of that they're exempt from the rules on safety because they're toys not clothing wow. so yeah thanks for asking because it's yeah. one of those things I feel that's really wrong <laughs> no, yeah it sounds like there's not not only there's a there's a bit of a gap there in terms of legislation but you know a clear uh, clear niche there for some more high-tech fabrics in that in that space Maybe. Yeah, we well, we've tried to uh, really, really sad, tragically, really in our in this area, there's a um, a manufacturer of bridal um, dresses, and and they don't they won't they buy cheap stuff from China because they say the UK market won't pay the price, whereas we're exporting most of what we make in the dress net market to the to Europe and the States and even some of it to Asia, so that it's a crazy world. Most of what we do is export, to be honest. 
the UK market doesn't pay the price for high performance necessarily. Um, Peter, getting back to the manufacturing process, yeah. um, are you, do, do the um, machines that you use, do they have any sort of sensors or anything to detect faults or anything that needs maintenance or anything like that um, as they're being produced? Yeah, they have um, what's called droppers, which sense when any thread breaks, they automatically stop for that. Um, that's already in place. That's been in, in, that was invented a long time ago. Um, and we also we have a monitoring system on them, which which records every break and everything that goes wrong. So it tells us if there's an ongoing issue, if something keeps breaking and uh, again and again, then we'll look at it. What's going on? But beyond that, the next step, which we're working on, is to have full camera inspection on every meter of fabric as it's happening. So as well as having the uh, walkway so we can visually inspect, we're trying to bring that uh, to use camera inspection. And we've been working with a, an Israeli company on that. Um, actually, they're now German and I think well, the, the textile part of their business is, is, uh, has been sold off. Um, but so far, they've struggled because uh, if you look at a parachute fabric, you'll see it's got a rip stop design and the, the camera works really well on a plain fabric, but if you have any kind of design in it, it sees the design as a flaw or defect and stops the machine. So we've, we've yet to perfect the camera inspection, but that's the next stage that we want to get to, is full 100% camera inspection. Wow, okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know we reached our time. I've got one more question if you're, if you're willing. What yeah, you, I'm happy you to stay and ask, answer any questions you've got. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, what you mentioned that you're involved in a couple of projects with NASA now. Yeah. Can you tell us anything about that? Or should we expect to see Ethco Fabrics come up with um, something further afield than Mars even? Uh, there is talk about going back to Titan again, but we haven't uh, got any further than the talking stage on that one. Um, yeah, there's two, two main projects at the moment. One is to put sensors into fabric because the thought is that a lot of these canopies are over-engineered, massively over-engineered. So over years and years of trial and error, a lot of, um, a lot of ejector seat canopies have, they consist of three or four different fabrics to minimize the weight with the strongest fabrics in certain areas and the weakest fabrics where they're not required to be so strong, if you see what I mean. But the, uh, currently the space fabric or, the, or the, the NASA fabrics have been made predominantly out of one fabric, which suggests it's overkill in some areas. But no one knows how parachute stresses are exactly in a fabric. So we're weaving in optic fibers at the moment for a company based in California um, that then attaches the sensors and they work a lot in the medical field. Uh, so in theory, the, well, the aim is to deploy the canopy fabric and detect where all the stresses are in the fabric to so we can look at over time developing fabrics that are the right strength for the right area of the canopy the the crown of the canopy i think you know the disc part is a disc gap band parachute the disc and the, the crown of the disc sees the most stress probably and the size the and especially the um the band probably sees very little stress but no one really knows exactly how it works so there's all these theories but the thought is that they're massively over-engineered and we could take take the weight down which is really critical because apparently to get a man to to mars will take 40 times the amount of uh payload of the mars rover so that's going to be a pretty huge mission uh, multiple missions to get there i'm sure with all the stuff so yeah, we need to work on that. So that's one thing. And there's another project with, for NASA, which I can't talk about, but it doesn't take a genius to work out what the next stage is. Um, because we're taking samples on Mars, aren't we? So we're taking samples on Mars to bring them back. And Very cool. Bringing them back is going to be harder than what's been done so far. So that's the current project. And we've done, we've just done eight iterations of the next project and we're making another four now because uh, we're trying to get the right balance of air permeability, weight and strength.
And again, we this time we, we overshot the strength again. So now we're taking the, the weight or they've taken the mass and the volume down to try and um, you know maximize the performance and minimize the weight. When you say you, you said optic fibers, so when you're saying optic fibers, I'm I'm thinking like a camera, but it is I'm I'm probably thinking of the wrong kind of a thing. <laughs> um, well, not totally the wrong sort of thing. Yeah, there's an optic okay. fi- there's optic fi- optic fiber sensing. There's a way they're going to do it. Now I don't know the mechanics of it. Our bit of the project is to put it in precisely where it needs to be, and get it to sit in the fabric and not. Uh, it's it's not as easy as it sounds because um the optic fiber doesn't want to behave like a yarn and we needed to tr- to try and find an optic fiber that behaves like a yarn then they would attach sensors to it at the other end which i know they have been doing relatively successfully and scale it up into a parachute wow okay yeah <laughs> cool um one of the questions here is uh, is there any do you have any connection to uh, air balloon fabric hot air balloon fabric we've yeah. we've, we've made yeah yeah so like we've supplied Cameron balloons before in Bristol, um, but that market's very quiet at the moment, as you can imagine. Sure. So yeah. What's the output for you guys? How like how many um, parachutes are you making a year? Do you know offhand? You mean meters of parachute fabrics? We don't make the parachutes, so. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So meters of parachute fabric depends on, on what the order book's like, really. But it's hundreds of thousands of meters. Um, I think in World War II, we made millions of meters. But now we're down to the hundreds of thousands. I'm in the kitchen now, that's what the noise is. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter, you said the, the um, Mars canopy, was that, was that, was that the biggest? ever made so how many i believe it is yeah 72 foot diameter so i don't think there's anything that big it was deployed in the uh, biggest wind tunnel in the world which is the nasa ames facilities united states air force wind tunnel and i and i think they're not allowed to use it again because they caused some damage doing it (laughs) because a bigger wind tunnel and there is no bigger wind tunnel so and the next is it, as, you say, it's a bit, as I say, it's, a, it's much bigger than the thing they need to land next time, uh, all the things, and therefore the wind tunnels, there's no wind tunnel big enough to do the testing. So they'll have to go straight to, to more deployment from Earth and then aspire rocket testing again, high altitude rocket testing, which is fine by me, because it means they need to take more fabric. <laughs> Hi, uh, have you, so I was just trying to think of other extreme environments for, have, have you made fabrics for things like the um, polar, um, polar kind of exploration or scientific, um, scientific stations in the polar region? No, I, I, I don't know whether we have, we've made fabrics for um, parachutes that are dropped in polar regions, I know that. Um, I don't know. We've got a fabric that's on the International Space Station that's used in the life support system, that's used in the uh, alkaline electrolysis of water to make hydrogen and oxygen. That's a pretty special fabric. Um, and the trickle down of that for that project is that the, that same fabric is going to be used in the mass generation of hydrogen for renewable energy systems which is probably the way forward rather than oh, very cool. batteries. Yeah. Yeah. So when we, when we, we think, we hope that the, uh, um, the fuel cell um, electric vehicle is the answer to the problem of uh, car pollution rather than plug-in electric vehicles because we haven't got any <laughs> much of a place in those. I mean, I'm talking from a commercial point of view, it's better for us. But personally, I don't think in a rural area, area like Devon, it's very unlikely that plug-in is going to work very well. It's great if you live in California, everybody's got a, a drive to park their car on. But uh, yeah, not so easy in somewhere like London or in Devon. 
Well, if there's no other questions, Peter, this has been great. We really appreciate your time and speaking with us today. And, and I think no we've problem. all learned a lot and it was really interesting. So this was a treat for us. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the questions. If there's more questions afterwards, just email them on to me and I'll see if I can answer them. That would be great. And um, maybe we can uh, look forward to speaking with you again after the next mission is yeah. successfully well, completed. Exxon Mars is next in 2023. We're supplying the Exxon Mars um, project as well for the European Space Agency. So that was, that's the next one. Awesome. Oh, that'd be yeah. great. I'm sure Geo will keep tabs on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Great. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. Really appreciate thanks it. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Cheers. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Matt. Bye.